Welcome back to the second session of Bursting Wineskins. I'm Gary Palouse Overden with Phillips Theological Seminary, the Center for Religion and Public Life. This week we're going to look at how to pay attention to the matrix of religion and politics. Religion and politics comprise a pairing related to, but different from, church and state. We in the U.S. have tried to keep church and state separate, but religion and politics are inseparable. Religion and politics are both realms of meaning-making within cultures. For many cultures, ancient and modern, they're actually part of the same cloth. The American genius and our constant challenge is to work with religion in the public realm without installing a national religion. While sometimes religion and politics taste sour together, like vinegar-tainted water, they're really more like two kinds of vinegar swirled together. The mixture may or may not be a tasty combination, depending on one's palate and the combination. Using another metaphor, religion and politics travel the same neural pathways in society. Those pathways are a neural mesh comprised of story, boundaries of belonging, the permissions and prohibitions of moral order, and how we define obstacles and the means to overcome problems. Story, belonging, moral order, and obstacles, empowerment, create and express meaning. Each combination of these four cultural tools, whether religious or political, constructs a meaning-laden worldview and a set of rules in which and by which a nation lives. It's important to pay attention to how these cultural tools work together and compete and conflict. So let me unpack. Start with story. Story is fundamental to religion and to politics. Religious and political stories offer dramatic depiction of where a people came from and from whom they came, where and who they are now, and where they are or ought to be headed. A few examples. In religion, Christianity's Apostles' Creed tells a story. God created, Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Scholars, including Philip's own Warren Carter, highlight the contrast between the politics of Jesus as evident in the upside-down empire of God as expressed in the Beatitudes in the Lord's Prayer. The Roman Empire's famed Pax Romana, achieved through social hierarchy, public displays of patronage, and terror, tells quite a different story. In politics, one story frame for the U.S. is the nation is exceptional and chosen, as we talked about last week. Another story frame is that the nation grew from a soil fed by dreams of liberty and happiness, but deformed by the toxin of white supremacy. In the interplay between religion and politics and regarding story, Christianity has provided both the elements of the chosen people story, and especially through the black church, has been a prophetic critic of the chosen exceptional people narrative. To paraphrase Langston Hughes' wonderful poem, Let America Be America Again, America must become America, but America has not yet been. Belonging. Who belongs? How is belonging achieved? Who is included or excluded by whom and why? Every social group, every religion, every nation lives their answers to these questions. Examples again. In religion, some communions and denominations practice a closed table for the sacrament of communion, meaning that only the family, that is, for instance, those in communion with the Catholic Church, those who are members of a particular Missouri Synod Lutheran congregation, are allowed to partake at the table. Others, such as disciples and only after battle within the Restorationist movement, and the United Methodists practice an open table. In addition, many congregations from various traditions are torn regarding if and how LGBTQ persons belong. Example from politics and belonging. 
One of the chief manifestations of polarization in the U.S. today is illustrated by how different partisans answer the question of who belongs in the United States. Who is a real American? And where is the real America? Immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees, do they belong? Citizens of New York and L.A., are they the real America? In some circles, shouts of, get out, socialist, and go back to those lousy places you came from, greet those citizens who disagreed with President Trump's administration and policies. On a recent trip that my family took through Missouri, I saw signs I'd not seen since the 1970s. America, love it or leave it. If you don't love it without question or quarrel, that is when the right administration is in power, you don't belong. The interplay between religion and politics and belonging. President Trump surrounded himself with advisors who believe the nation is for Christians and who invoke Jesus as they tighten the southern border or attempted to exclude persons from Muslim nations. People of faith who leave food and water in the desert for immigrants and refugees in the name of their faith were fined heavily. In those cases, uh, we don't help those who don't belong. Moral order. Nearly everyone associates religion with morality. Even cynics do so as they highlight the all too available examples of immorality and hypocrisy committed by the allegedly religious. But politics also offers a moral order. Each species of politics reflects and promotes a moral order. Every legislated policy is an expression of moral order. Essentially, moral order is the network of obligations expected of persons in a social group by others in the social group. A moral order defines who is neighbor and what is owed to neighbors. This means a moral order also defines to whom we do not owe care or a welcome. A moral order includes the gap between what is and what ought to be, as well as whether anything ought to be done to close that gap. In religion, the Ten Commandments define a moral order, as do the Beatitudes. An eye for an eye suggests a moral order. The Golden Rule, which is present in some form in most of the world's religions, is perhaps the most well-known example of a teaching that is supposed to shape moral order. In politics, pay close attention to how politicians talk about what members of a society owe to each other and who is responsible for what in order to foster prosperity and alleviate suffering. At the national level, socialist activist Democrats, corporate Democrats, so-called moderate Democrats, pre-Trump Republicans, Trumpist Republicans, and libertarians assert distinctive and sometimes contradictory moral orders. A moral order in which separating children from families entering the country illegally is a moral practice expresses a very different understanding of order from one that claims illegal immigration should be a misdemeanor and that separating children from their families is an evil practice. The interplay between religion and politics. Which narratives, values, and social practices shape a society's moral order, inform public policy, and lead us to vote for A rather than B? Where do those narratives, values, and social practices come from? They will come either from religion or from whatever in a society functions like religion. Obstacles and empowerment. In order to become the people we, we the people of faith, we people of the U.S., could and should be, there are obstacles to be overcome. And there are sources of empowerment to overcome those obstacles. In religion, Christian doctrine asserts that sin is an obstacle. Sin might be defined as pride, as lack of self-respect, as blinding self-interest, as failure to love, as disease, as participation in the brokenness of life. Some Christians see the obstacle of sin purely in personal terms. Others see sin primarily in systems of oppression. Others see sin as both personal and embedded in cultures and institutions. The antidote to sin is God's grace available through faith in Jesus Christ, available through sacraments, through hearing the word, through works of social justice, through turning around as in repentance, 
through baptism by the Holy Spirit, through prayer, and through corporate worship. In politics, think of obstacles to being the nation we should be, according to the Republican Party's current narrative versus the Biden administration, as well as the different understandings of how one is empowered to succeed. Are the obstacles liberals, socialists, white evangelicals, white supremacists, immigrants here illegally, government schools, mass incarceration, the denigration of the founders, the inability to tell the ugly parts of the truth about ourselves, too much spending on the military, social programs that create dependencies, Roe v. Wade, Citizens United, Supreme Court and federal judicial appointments, a bloated federal government, the president, the former president, and always the Clintons, and on and on. Is empowerment gained through America first policies in the world? Building a wall, deregulating businesses, appointing conservative Christian justices, a presidency that is superior to the courts and Congress in power, overturning societies and franchising and liberalizing policies going back to the Civil Rights Act, and favoring the Second and Tenth Amendments above all others, except for the free exercise of religion part of the First Amendment as it applies to conservative Christians? Or is empowerment gained through laws and practices that lead toward equity, social justice, reparations, the DREAM Act, community policing, accessible and affordable medical care for everyone, better funded and imagined public schools, ensuring clean air, water, and healthy soil, responding to climate change with urgency, and otherwise persuading everyone to participate in the work of living into our reality of becoming the most multicultural, multi-religious experiment in democracy the world has ever known. Now let's take a look at several extended examples for how story, belonging, moral order, and empowerment play out in some public documents. <clears throat> the first example is presidential candidate Barry Goldwater's acceptance speech in 1964. You may recall the Johnson administration had just successfully passed the Civil Rights Act, and Goldwater famously did not endorse that act. Here's Goldwater's words. The good Lord raised this mighty Republican Republic to be a home for the brave and to flourish as the land of the free, not to stagnate in the swampland of collectivism, not to cringe before the bully of communism, my aside here, this one sentence hits all four realms of meaning, story, moral order, belonging, obstacle, uh, and the like, and, and, and both religious and political dimensions, all in that one sentence. Now, my fellow Americans, the tide has been running against freedom. Our people have followed false prophets. We must and we shall return to proven ways, not because they are old, but because they are true. So overcoming. During four feudal years, the administration which we shall replace has distorted and lost that faith. It has talked and talked and talked and talked the words of freedom, but it has failed and failed and failed in the works of freedom. That is, the overcoming and moral order you see both in there. The growing menace in our country's, to our country's safety is tonight is to personal safety, to life, to limb and property, and homes and churches or on the playgrounds and places of business, particularly in our great cities, is the mounting concern, or should be, of every thoughtful citizen of the United States. Security from domestic violence, no less than from foreign aggression, is the most elementary and fundamental purpose of any government. And a government that cannot fulfill this purpose is one that cannot long command the loyalty of its citizens, where he's invoking story and moral order. History shows us, demonstrates that nothing, nothing prepares the way for tyranny more than the failure of public officials to keep the streets, streets safe from bullies and marauders. So you have moral order and a threat to the fundamental story. Now we Republicans see all this as more, much more than the result of mere political differences or, more, uh, or, or mere political mistakes. We see this as the result of a fundamentally and absolutely wrong view of man, his nature, and his destiny. So the, the democratic story is wrong, and therefore their moral order is wrong. Their mistaken course stems from false notions, ladies and gentlemen, of equality. 
Equality rightly understood as our founding fathers understood it leads to liberty and to the emancipation of creative differences. Wrongly understood it as has been so tragically in our time. It leads first to conformity and then to despotism, moral order. My fellow Republicans, we do no man a service by hiding freedom's light under a bushel of mistaken humility. I seek an America proud of its past, proud of its ways, proud of its dreams and determined actively to proclaim them. We Republicans seek a government that attends to its inherent responsibilities of maintaining a stable monetary and fiscal climate, encouraging a free and competitive economy, and enforcing law and order. So you see story belonging, moral order overcoming all right there. Now, I'm going to jump forward to April 2018. Uh, Reverends William Barber and Liz Theo Harris are leaders of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. They released a moral agenda and declaration of fundamental rights. They say in their summary, the demands contained within that document present a comprehensive response to the systematic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and war economy plaguing our country today, which all story in moral order. So here's a summary of that document. For the 140 million people who are poor, or one emergency situation away from being poor, we know these demands are necessary. So belonging and moral order. This poor people's moral budget asks, given the resources of our society, whether these demands are also possible. Our answer is a resounding yes. In the seven sections of the moral budget, we look at policies and investments for seven critical areas of the poor people's moral agenda. One, democracy and equal protection under the law. Two, domestic tranquility. Three, peace in the common defense. Four, life and health. Five, the planet. Six, our future. And seven, an equitable economy. So they're laying out a moral order with elements of all the others. You see how there's a story forming here. In each case, we found that our nation has abundant resources to meet the demands of the poor and to address the widespread and systematic injustices we face. In contrast, the current realities of voter suppression, low and inconsistent wages, insecure access to health care and other basic needs, wealth inequality, war, and climate change are far costlier than we have been led to believe. All these are challenges to America's ideal self and to belonging. This budget shows it's possible to invest our resources in the ways demanded by this campaign and our moral and constitutional values to establish justice, domestic tranquility, security, and the general welfare of all. It shows, too, just how wasteful systemic injustice is. The abundance of our society will grow even greater when we stop investing in maintaining injustice to benefit the few and turn instead to policies based on the needs of the many. Well, besides attending to the political religious matrix of story belonging moral order and empowerment. There's another idea I use to answer the question, what's happening, what's going on? And that's comparing culture to soil. Life on the entire planet depends on healthy soil to create and sustain the necessary matrix for life. Similarly, good life in any human community requires healthy cultures that contain the nutrients for desirable elements to grow and flourish and that discouraged the growth of undesirable elements. The United States of America was not founded in order for government to grow religion. From the point of view of the Constitution, religion is not a crop the government is supposed to grow. However, from the point of view of the Constitution, religion provides soil nutrients or potential soil nutrients for the thriving of democracy and public life. So now let's dig into these ideas. Soil. Without healthy soil, life on Earth as we know it would cease. A teaspoon of healthy soil contains up to a billion microorganisms. Yes, a billion in a teaspoon. In addition to microorganisms, healthy soil is composed of minerals, organic materials, air, and water. There's a movement today among some farmers and gardeners to practice regenerative agriculture because of the amount of death industrial agriculture poured into the soil. 
the heavy use of petroleum-based chemicals to enhance soil in order to increase yield will, over time, kill or nearly kill the soil. Regenerative agriculture pays attention not primarily to measures such as crop yield in a given year, but to a much longer calendar, how alive and healthy is the soil. Farmers practicing regenerative agriculture work to regenerate the health of the soil, which in turn increases the health of everything and everyone that depends on the soil. In other words, all the rest of life on the planet. Healthy soil does a lot of work. It composts dead animals and plants and turns all of us back into the building blocks of life for something or someone else. Healthy soil grows plants that sequester carbon. That means plants draw carbon from the atmosphere and send the carbon down in the roots. The looser the soil, the deeper the roots, the deeper the carbon is sequestered. A soil's total ecology creates the hospitable environment for all kinds of plants, desirable and undesirable. But establishing a good crop of healthy plants in healthy soil makes it more difficult for undesirable plants to invade. Now, culture. Culture is a term we give to the webs of meaning human beings weave to assign value to life. Culture is the communication, ritual, story, meaning, spirit, soul dimension of family, group, organization, and society. Human animals are social animals. We require care from and interaction with other human beings over a long period of time in order to develop into a healthy human being, into a person. Relationships with caregivers are essential for human development, but culture is essential too. There is no human life without culture, and healthy cultures create and sustain life worth living. So, culture as soil. Culture is like soil. Cultures are complex biosystems. There are healthy, life-giving cultures, and there are death-dealing and nearly dead cultures. There are cultures full of nourishing plants in which a wide variety of people thrive, and others invaded by noxious elements with much death and few who thrive. Some cultures benefit from composting the past and allowing the new to grow. Some cultures would benefit from a lot more composting. Imagine that every culture is an ecology that encourages the growth of some plants, ideas, movements, moral values, and institutions and discourages others. Which crops are we trying to grow in the United States? If we call to mind the Declaration of Independence, we might want to say uh, that we grow life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But since life is an all-encompassing word, let's say the Declaration names liberty and pursuit of happiness as two plants to grow in American cultural soil. Then the preamble of the Constitution might add these fruits to liberty and the pursuit of happiness a more perfect union, justice, domestic peace, security, the general welfare. All of these together are America's crops. If these are the crops the U.S. cultural soil is designed to grow, then consider the nutrients and protections necessary for these crops. Consider families, which with the aid of other organizations have the ability to form responsible self-governing persons. Particular practices of democracy, such as free and fair voting in elections and offering an informed electorate valid and healthy choices. An economy that encourages wealth, yes, and guards against destabilizing inequality. Robust education for an informed electorate, for the pursuit of happiness, and for a well-trained workforce. A quality of public conversation and argument sufficient to deal with the differences, conflicts, problems, and challenges. Sufficient social capital and social cohesion. This likely inclu includes a shared story in which each can see ourselves and recognize others in that story. The moral and legal guardrails evenly applied to encourage some behaviors and discourage others. Institutions to support health and well-being adequate sa safety and protection from enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, one might also imagine some weeds and toxins that might invade the soil and undermine desirable crops, such as public leaders giving encouragement to white supremacists and other political social positions once considered extreme. 
the potential of gun violence at any time in, hope, in homes, workplaces, schools, and other public spaces. Hidden and suppressed histories of violence and injustice, disease, persisting inequalities, prejudiced systems of justice and employment, extreme individualism or coerced conformity, fear amplified and promoted by turning people and ideas into enemies, tipping liberty rights to privilege particular groups and interests, as in religious free exercise rights trumping all other rights, and no concern for mutuality, and in a time stamp span that privileges today rather than also considering tomorrow and generations in the future. A strictly punitive criminal justice system. Well, those are toxins, weeds. Well, what about religion? I didn't include religion so far really either as a crop or as a soil element. Which is it in the US polity? Well, the answer depends on one's point of view. From the point of view of the Constitution, religion is not a government-grown crop. However, from the point of view of the Constitution, religion has a role as a potential soil nutrient. It may feed the American cultural crops and thus profoundly affect the nutrient value and taste of those crops, negatively or positively. Now, imagine what justice, liberty, domestic tranquility, or common defense looks like if fed by a punishing God religion rather than a loving God religion. Imagine what a religion that promotes the exploitation of any and every natural resource, as in human beings have dominion, so drill, baby, drill, um, adds to the soil, as compared to a religion that treated the earth as divinely blessed miracle and home for life that all we know. Or in the words of the theologian Sally McFaig, if the earth were imagined as God's body. If constitutionally religion is a nutrient, then religion can influence the taste and nutritional value of a crop, but cannot itself be a government-grown crop. In fact, the more a government-grown crop looks like a particular religion, the closer to an established religion that crop becomes, and therefore the more protest should arise against that crop. But I know there's another point of view. From the point of view of religion, religion may be its own plant and requires a friendly ecosystem in which to grow. Religion seeks free exercise, meaning a cultural soil ecology that allows the religion to flourish, either by leaving it alone to form its own fence gardens, think the Amish, or by encouraging the nutrients and plants and discouraging the seeds and toxins that are incompatible with religion. In this perspective, public spaces must be made hospitable to religions. One might interpret the current controversies in which religious, religious liberties are asserted, such as refusing service, mask, and vaccine resistance, and the appointment of religiously conservative justices and judges as efforts to change the cultural ecology to plant religious crops and provide the soil necessary for these crops to flourish. Now, if you take soil as culture, I, I draw two conclusions. One, if we're not getting the crops we want or need, we need to pay close attention to the soil. Is the cultural soil healthy? From my point of view, no. Cultural soil today in our country is full of toxins, low on its ability to recycle death into life, and full of weeds. In the U.S., we are harvesting the public life and democracy that we've planted that have grown in soil hospitable for the harvest we are getting, and not in soil that is able to grow a multicultural shared power democracy that can deliver on America's promises for the vast majority of citizens and guests. Second conclusion, we religious and spiritual types should pay closer attention to the nutrients and toxins we are providing to the soil of culture. We are responsible for what we contribute and we have contributed both nutrients and toxins. We should work on the side of those who are trying to regenerate this soil into a culture that grows the public virtues of the Declaration the Constitution for all America's peoples and care less about rendering the soil fit primarily for us. I'm going to close with two examples of what Christians have added to America's soil. Here is an excerpt from a sermon by Cotton Mather, 
a leading Puritan divine. He gave the sermon in 1696 regarding the obligations of slaves and masters to each other with an emphasis on what slaves owe. I would consider these a toxin added to the American soil. Or rather, here is an example of just how deep that rhizome of racism runs in our history, both American history and Christian history. So this from Cotton Mather, 1696, a good master well served. And will not the scores of slaves, the poor blacks, now also in this assembly, give earnest heed unto these words of God? Give ear, you pitied blacks, give ear. It is allowed in the scriptures to the Gentiles that they may keep slaves. Although the law of charity requires your owners to use you as those that have reasonable souls within you. You see story and moral belonging and uh, moral order belonging in there. Yea, t'would be against the conscience of any good man to keep you for slaves if he find himself unable to use you according to the law of charity. But the most of you have so little cause to desire you to be other than slaves that you are, where you are, that it would soon make you miserable to be otherwise. For you are better fed and better clothed and better managed by far than you would be if you were on your own. Moral order. All that now remains for you is to become first the good servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and then of those who have purchased you. You notice how the Bible is used here to justify slavery. There was a country of swarthy people of whom was foretold in Psalm 68, Ethiopia, or more truly Arabia, shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. Well then, poor Ethiopians, which is what he's calling the, uh, the enslaved persons in the assembly, do you now stretch out your hands unto the Lord, even those poor black hands of yours? The Lord calleth for them. Lift those hands of yours in petitions to the Lord. Pray constantly as well as you can that the Lord would make you servants unto himself and pardon you and accept you and save you through Jesus Christ forever. Note how God is, uh, uh, Jesus is sounding like Jesus needs enslaved persons also, servants. That you will be servants of the Lord by the help of his grace as long as you live. And be sure that you never stretch forth your hands unto any evil. Always keep your hand from doing any evil. Do not by fornication, by stealing, by lying, by running away. Make yourselves infinitely black or then you are already. Note how black here is associated with being bad. No, put yourselves into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be willing that the Lord Jesus Christ should make you his own. And then for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, be good servants unto those that own you. Do for your masters and your mistresses all the service that you can and be orderly in everything. So again, hear, hear the association between blackness here. So that your skins be dark as night, yet your souls will be washed white in the blood of the Lamb and entitled unto an inheritance of light. Though you are in slavery to men, yet you shall be free men of the Lord, the children of God. Though you are fed among the dogs with the orts of our tables, yet you shall be at length lie down into a feast with Abraham himself and the heaven of the blessed. Whatever you have in this life, there's, you get something in the next. Um, don't be discouraged. It will be but a little, a little, a little while, and all your pains will end, and everlasting joys that you overcoming you expect will happen in the next life. But if you break the moral order in this life, Mather concludes, but if you will not be such orderly servants, tis a terrible thing I have to say unto you. All the sorrows that you see in this world are but the beginnings of sorrows and little emblems of the sorrows that remain for you in another. Do you meet with hunger here? You shall be hungry and hardly bestead forever. Does the heat oppress you here? You shall be there tormented in a flame hotter than in the brimstone forever. Could the cold afflict you here? You shall have gnashing of teeth forever. Do you have sometimes want your sleep? There you shall not rest, neither day or night, forever. Are you beaten here? Why, the devil will be your overseer, and you'll be weltering under intolerable blows and wounds, world without end. Masters, these poor Negroes will hardly mind what I say. I pray, do you repeat it unto them. And here is Fannie Lou Hamer's speech given in September 1964 
during the hot season of the continuing battle for civil rights. Where she said to the church audience, you see the point is about this and you can't deny it. Not either one of you here in this room. Not Negroes, we have prayed for a change in the state of Mississippi for years. And God made it so plain, he sent Moses down in Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And he made it so plain here in Mississippi, the man that heads the project is named Moses, Bob Moses. And he sent Bob Moses, by the way, an organizer of the Freedom Summer who just died this last July. He sent him down to Mississippi to tell all of these hate groups to let his people go. You see, in this struggle, some people say that, well, she doesn't talk too good. Well, the type of education that we get here, years to come, you won't talk too good. The type of education we get in the state of Mississippi will make our minds so narrow it won't coordinate with our big bodies. This is one of the next things that I don't like, she said. Every church door in the state of Mississippi should be open for these meetings, but preachers have preached for years what he didn't himself believe. And if he's willing to trust God, if he's willing to trust God, he won't mind opening the church door because the first words of Jesus' public ministry was, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news, the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim and bring relief to the captive. And you know we are living in a captivated society today. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is beginning to reproach America today and we want what is rightfully ours. You notice the sin being systemic there. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm not going to get in this mess because if you were born in America with a black face, you were born in this mess, which is her naming of the America's moral order. And then after being beaten in Minnesota, she tells a story about that. She says, we are not fighting against these people because we hate them, but we are fighting these people because we love them. And we're the only thing that can save them now. We are fighting to save these people from their hate and from all the things that would be so bad against them. We want them to see the right way. Every night of my life when I lay down before I go to sleep, I pray to the, for these people that despitefully use me. And Christ said that the meek shall inherit the earth. And he said before one tenth, one, one jot of the word, would, would pass, would fail. Heaven and earth would pass away, but his word would stand forever. And I believe tonight that one day in Mississippi, if I have to die for this, we shall overcome. So she there, she, she names story, she names moral order, she names belonging, she names overcoming in a way very different from the dominant American religious narrative. So for our discussion on Thursday night, uh, questions to start with will be, uh, what are we Christians adding to the soil to benefit the nation at this particular time? What are we adding that is not helpful? What are the toxins or weeds in the soil that are hindering the crops the nation should be growing? Please email me at gary.paluso at ptstulsa.edu and I look forward to talking with you on Thursday night.